Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing voltage-gated ion channels. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of discussing the action potential, okay, to motivate our later discussion of the voltage-gated ion channels. Okay, right, so we've discussed that the action potential is going to be initiated at the axon hillock of neurons, okay, and it's going to be initiated when you get a large enough net amount of positive charge arriving in the cytoplasm of the axon hillock, okay, so we've discussed that uh, the dendrites of the neuron will be covered in dendritic spines, which will have other neurons synapsing onto them, and those neurons will either be trying to excite the neuron or inhibit the neuron. Okay, if they're trying to excite the neuron, they'll release glutamate onto the dendritic spine, which will open ligand gated ion channels, which allow sodium current into the cytoplasm of the neuron. Okay, if they're trying to inhibit the neuron, they'll release GABA onto the dendritic spine, which will open ligand gated ion channels, which will allow a chloride current into the cell. Okay, we've discussed then that these sodium and chloride currents parts of them, little traces of them, will arrive in the cytoplasm of the axon hillock, and of course, uh, then what has to happen is we have to weigh up which is bigger or are they equal to one another. So if excitation is big enough, uh, bigger than the um, inhibition by enough, then we'll get a net amount of positive charge arriving into uh, the cytoplasm of the axon hillock. Okay, and this will depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane up to the threshold potential for the activation of voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels, which is around negative 40 millivolts. Okay, then what will happen is both of those types of voltage-gated ion channel will be activated to open. However, we've discussed that voltage-gated sodium channels, they don't faff about. They get on with the job right away. They open very, very quickly. Whereas the voltage-gated potassium channels, although they're activated to open at about the same time as the voltage-gated sodium channels, uh, they are much more uh, faffy with actually opening. So they haven't opened yet. We haven't seen them open yet, even though my picture has them them open in preparation. Okay, right. Uh, so we've discussed that when the voltage-gated sodium channels open in response to the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane being depolarized beyond negative 40 millivolts, you'll get a sodium current coming into the cytoplasm of the cell. That will further depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane up to around plus 40 millivolts. And then by the time you've got up to around plus 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels now go into the inactivated state, which is a different state to the closed state, although effectively it's the same as the closed state in that um, you're not getting any sodium current going through. Okay, but it is a fundamentally different state. Okay, you don't go back to the closed state until the electrical potential difference is back below negative 40 millivolts. Okay, so something different has closed the channel in the inactivated state, and we'll see what that something different is later on. Okay, right. Uh, so the voltage-gated sodium channels have now closed uh, or inactivated, but the reality is that they're no longer conductive. Okay, uh, so there's no more sodium current coming into the cytoplasm of the cell, and then at about the time when the voltage-gated potassium channels, sorry, at about the time when the voltage-gated sodium channels have uh, just finished their job, they've just inactivated, then now the voltage-gated potassium channels just about get around to actually opening. Okay, so they were activated to open all the way down here. The instant the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane got beyond negative 40 millivolts, they were activated activated to open, but they were so faffy, okay, that they're only starting to open once the voltage-gated sodium channels have done their job already. Okay, so now the voltage-gated potassium channels open. Okay, so when we open a potassium channel in the cell membrane, what is going to happen? Okay, well, to understand which direction potassium is going to move in, we need to consider two things, the concentration gradient of potassium across the cell membrane and the electrical gradient across the cell membrane. So let's start off with the concentration gradient.
Okay, so remember, uh, extracellular potassium is much lower than intracellular potassium. Okay, extracellular potassium is around 4 millimolar, whereas intracellular potassium is around 155 millimolar. So there is a, around a 40-fold uh, potassium gradient favoring the movement out of the cell. Okay, so the concentration gradient says go out. Okay, the electrical gradient at the moment is plus 40 millivolts. So the intracellular electrical potential is 40 millivolts volts higher than the extracellular electrical potential. Potassium as a positively charged ion wants to go where the electrical potential is lower, which at the moment is the extracellular compartment. So initially, both the concentration gradient for potassium and the electrical gradient acting on potassium are in agreement and are saying go out. So you're going to get a lot of potassium going out initially. Okay, now this is going to have the exact opposite effect on the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane to sodium coming in, because now we're moving a positive current out of the cell. Okay, so effectively we are taking away positive charge from the intracellular compartment and that's going to make the electrical potential intracellularly fall back down. And we're dumping positive charge into the extracellular compartment, so that's going to make the electrical potential extracellularly go back up. So this line is going to go back up, this line is going to go back down, we're going to repolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, we're going to make it more negative once again. Okay, so now what will start to happen is the electrical potential difference will start to curve back around and you'll have the downstroke of the action potential. Now, uh, very quickly then, we will get back to the point where the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is negative once more, rather than positive. Okay, and you might wonder, well, is the potassium current going to stop then now? Okay, because now the electrical gradient says go in again, but remember, that electrical gradient is not going to be powerful enough to oppose the concentration gradient. We have got around a 40-fold concentration gradient of potassium favoring its movement out of the cell, okay? You would need quite a strong electrical gradient across the cell membrane to stop any potassium moving across it with a 40-fold concentration of uh, gradient for potassium, okay? In actual fact, you'd need an electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of around negative 85 in order to actually stop any potassium moving out, okay? That's the nernst potential for potassium. So in fact, you're still going to get potassium moving out of the cell even once you've uh, repolarized back down into the negative electrical potentials here. Okay, right. Uh, so you will continue repolarizing the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, and that uh, uh, annotation here is in the way completely. Okay, of course, what will be happening is as you uh, go down to the lower and lower electrical potential differences, then the current will be being decreased, okay, because of course the electrical gradient will no longer be in agreement with the concentration gradient, okay. So you're going to repolarize right down here, okay, and this is the downstroke of the action potential. Now voltage-gated potassium channels, they also inactivate, okay, and moreover, once you get back down to negative 65 millivolts, these voltage-gated potassium channels, they will start to actually go back into the closed state. So, you know, you've gone back down below the negative 40 millivolts threshold potential, and therefore the voltage-gated potassium channels will actually start to close back down because the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane uh, has returned to the more normal level, so they're no longer activated to be open in the first place. So you'll start to get voltage-gated potassium channels closing, basically. Okay, now, there is a final phase of the action potential that I want to talk about here, which is that the action potential actually dips back down below negative 65 millivolts here, okay, for a little while, and this is caused partly by these voltage-gated potassium channels remaining open for a little bit longer, okay, and then allowing in, uh, sorry, allowing out more potassium that takes you even below negative 65 millivolts, okay. But there's another thing that I want to mention here, which is the calcium-activated potassium channels. Okay, so this little dip that occurs here in the action potential below negative 65 millivolts, this is what's known as the after, uh, whoops, uh, I've missed out a word there, so let me start again. After hyperpolarization, okay, I missed out the hyper. Okay, so when you 
lower the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane to below negative 65 millivolts. That's called hyperpolarization. Okay, and this is the hyperpolarization that occurs after the main portion of the action potential. So it's called the after hyperpolarization. Now I've said part of it can be explained by the voltage gated potassium channels remaining open for a little bit longer before they're actually getting around to closing. Uh, because we're back below the negative 40 millivolts, okay? But it's very large here, okay? And in fact, there's another type of potassium channel that's important here, which are the calcium-activated potassium channels. So now I'm putting in another cell membrane here, okay? And once again, this will be the extracellular side, and this will be the intracellular side. And I want to now talk about two other types of ion channel here, okay? So, firstly, we're going to have the calcium-gated potassium channels, which I'll have here. So, C here is for calcium. Okay, so these are going to be opened by intracellular calcium. Okay, uh, and some of them are also activated by depolarization, but we'll dwell on the ones that are opened by calcium. Okay, and then the other ones that are going to be important here are the voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, right. So, basically, when the action potential occurs, the voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels are the most important ones in neurons. Okay, but in this region where the action potential is occurring, in this bit of cell membrane where this uh, fancy alteration in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is occurring, you will also have some voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, and not as many as the voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels, but some nevertheless, okay? And when you're depolarizing the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, as occurs in an action potential, the voltage-gated calcium channels will be open, okay? They'll be activated to open, and of course, when voltage-gated calcium channels open, we don't even need to think about the electrical gradient across the cell membrane. Uh, with calcium, you don't even need to consider the electrical gradient across the cell membrane. There is a 15 thousand fold gradient in the concentration of calcium across the cell membrane. No electrical potential difference you could ever dream up that would be physiological uh, across a neuron cell membrane is ever going to stop calcium from coming in when you open a calcium channel in the cell membrane. Okay, so when you open the voltage-gated calcium channels in the cell membrane, you'll be getting a little bit of calcium coming into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, this can then act on the calcium-gated potassium channels. In addition, the calcium-gated potassium channels, some of them are actually activated by depolarization themselves, so these will be activated in the action potential. And of course, when they open, they're going to allow potassium to come out of the cell. And these are partly responsible for this after hyperpolarization here. So these are what are remaining open even after the voltage-gated potassium channels are starting to close, and they're still open here, still allowing potassium to leave the cell, and that's what causes this little after-hyperpolarization here. It's one of the main things that's responsible for this after-hyperpolarization. You're continuing to allow potassium out of the cell, and that takes it right down to here until these channels start to finally close, okay, as the calcium is removed from the intracellular fluid, okay? Um, and of course the voltage-gated calcium channels will have closed by now because uh, we're back below the threshold potential. So the voltage-gated calcium channels have closed, no more calcium is coming in. Calcium is extruded from the cytoplasm of the cell very, very quickly, okay, because it's quite toxic. So that will go, and then the calcium-gated potassium channels will close, and then once you've returned the conductance across the cell membrane to the leaky sodium and potassium channels, then uh, the old equilibrium will re-establish gradually. So this is the re-establishing of the equilibrium, okay, and you'll return back to the resting membrane potential. Okay, and if you don't understand the resting membrane potential and that equilibrium, uh, then I do have videos in which uh, I explain that, okay, and we derive the goldman hodgkin katz constant field equation from the uh, Boltzmann distribution. Okay, I believe they're in a playlist on electrophysiology. Uh, right, uh, so that those calcium-gated potassium channels then, they are responsible for this little 
uh, well, they're partly responsible for this after hyperpolarization, uh, and the other part then is played by these voltage gated potassium channels remaining open. So the voltage gated potassium channels, they will be part of this, maybe this first little portion here, but then the more severe part down here will be played, that part will be played by the calcium gated potassium channels, and we will be studying these calcium gated potassium channels later on. Okay, right, so that's the action potential occurring across a little patch of membrane now. It's this elaborate alteration in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Okay, but that's all well and good. How does this actually propagate along an axon? After all, this is supposed to be sending a message from one side of the neuron to the other side of the neuron. So we need this disturbance to propagate, basically. Okay, and the reason it propagates from one portion of the axon, and I'll draw a fresh picture of this. So if we have our axon here, Okay, let's say that this first portion here is the axon hillock. We are now asking, okay, brilliant, we've seen that the action potential can occur in a little patch of membrane here in the axon hillock. We want to know how is this actually going to propagate along the axon. Well, basically, when you get this action potential occurring in a little patch of the membrane, what will happen is it will spread to the neighbouring portion. And the reason is that during this upstroke of the action potential, you are letting a lot of sodium come into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, and this sodium can diffuse over to the cytoplasm of this neighbouring portion of cell membrane here. Okay, and then it's exactly the same as what the original sodium coming from the dendritic spines did to the first portion of membrane. This net sodium coming over here will depolarize the electrical potential difference across this next portion of cell membrane up to threshold potential. Okay, and then this portion will then fire an actual potential. Okay, so now this next little patch will fire an action potential. And then when this little patch fires an action potential, it too will let in a lot of sodium ions, and those sodium ions will spread into the cytoplasm of the neighbouring portion of the membrane, and it will go on and on and on, propagating along the axon right into the axon terminal, where it will induce um, the release of neurotransmitter, and we won't discuss how action potentials actually cause the induction of the release of neurotransmitter. Okay, right, so action potentials are an example, basically, of saltatory conduction, okay, that's a key phrase, okay, uh, so what does saltatory conduction mean? Now, people often use saltatory conduction uh, interchangeably with action potentials, and that's not quite right. Saltatory conduction is more general than an action potential. Action potential refers to this specific phenomenon, this specific disturbance in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, which is capable of propagating along the cell membrane. Okay, saltatory conduction is a more general concept. Saltatory conduction is the concept that you can send a signal from one place to another place by having a disturbance here, cause a disturbance here, cause a disturbance here, cause a disturbance here. Saltatory conduction really is all about the domino effect. That one domino toppling can cause another domino to topple, can cause another domino to topple, can cause another domino to topple, and that's a way of sending a signal between two points. Okay, so saltatory conduction is more general. There are loads of other examples of saltatory conduction. Action potentials are a major, major example of saltatory conduction, but there are other examples of saltatory conduction in biology, such as calcium wave propagation uh, intracellularly, okay, and things like that. So, uh, don't use saltatory conduction interchangeably with uh, action potential, therefore. Okay, right, so that then is our discussion of the action potential complete. In the next video, what we will turn our attention onto is the voltage-gated potassium channels. We will discuss the structure of voltage-gated potassium channels, and then we'll move on to the gating mechanism.